I'm Saisha Grayson. I'm the assistant curator at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. And I'm thrilled to have you all here with me to welcome Chitra Ganesh, Mariam Ghani, and Christopher Myers to the Sackler Center Forum. You've hopefully had a chance to see Chitra's exhibition next door, Eyes of Time, uh, which includes a site-specific installation and artist-curated selection from the museum's encyclopedic collection. Having worked closely with Chitra on this project, I can attest to the dialogue, exploration, and sharing of ideas and points of inspiration that is part of her process. So it's unsurprising that as a suggested program for her show, she would want to open out to an artist roundtable that would include her close colleagues and collaborators as a way of talking about how exchanges and creative communities that stretch from Brooklyn to Afghanistan to India and Vietnam and beyond feed practices and projects here. I'd like to thank these three stellar artists and writers for joining us tonight. I'd also like to thank Jess Wilcox, our program manager, for uh, helping to organize this and the AV team as well, and Dr. Sackler for making all events at the Sackler Center possible. Looking ahead, I'd like to invite you to come back on May 17th. We have a symposium on uh, called Revising Revisionism, uh, looking at biography and feminist historiography, and that'll bring together academics, archivists, and artists to talk about the way that these practices inform each other. There are flyers in the back if you want more information. So to get to the main event, I'll give just brief introductions of the three artists, and then um, we'll get to hear them talk. Chitra Ganesh works across media from painting and installation to digital collages, film, and text-based artworks, excavating suppressed histories, interrogating given myths and literary tropes, and refiguring both the past and images of the future to find new spaces of possibility for female protagonists and their desires. A graduate of Brown University and Columbia's MFA program, she's the recipient of numerous awards, most recently a Guggenheim Fellowship in the Creative Arts and the endowed Kirslarkar Visiting Scholars Program at Rhode Island School of Design. Her work is in museum collections around the world, from MoMA to Deutsche Bank Berlin to the Guangzhou Contemporary Art Museum, and recent solo museums have appeared at Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh and the Guten Kunsthalle Sweden. We are very happy that her most recent solo presentation is on view next door through July 12th. Mariam Ghani is an artist, filmmaker, writer, teacher, and activist. Activities that often blur and overlap through her research-based and politically engaged practices. Interested in the intersection between place, memory, history, language, loss, and reconstruction, her work has been supported by everyone from the Soros Foundation to Creative Capital, the Experimental Television Center to Art Matters, and recent public commissions from Creative Time and the Arab American National Museum in Detroit. Her work has been exhibited and screened internationally, including at Documenta 13, two Sharjah Biennials, MoMA, and the Tate Modern, to name just a few. A graduate at NYU and SVA's MFA program, she lectures widely and her writing appears in international art, media, and political outlets. Her most recent solo exhibition is on view at the St. Louis Art Museum through July 8th. And as an author and illustrator of children's books, Christopher Myers combines drawing, woodcut, collage, and photography to create contemporary compelling images that along with the stories they accompany combat the lack of diversity in children's literature an issue he drew attention to in a widely shared New York Times article, The Apartheid of Children's Literature, last year. Myers has worked collaboratively with his father, noted children's author Walter Dean Myers, on numerous projects over the years, including 1998's award-winning Harlem, before going on to write and illustrate the equally acclaimed Black Cat. Most recently, he won the Coretta Scott King Book Award for Best Illustrations for Firebird, ballet dancer Misty Copeland's autobiographical children's book. A graduate of Brown University in the Whitney Independent Study Program, Myers also works regularly in fine art and fashion contexts. The video and installation he made in collaboration with the Propeller Group was one of the most talked about and recommended stops at Prospect 3 in New Orleans this year. So we are really honored to have such an amazing group of artists um, with us who all have such great projects to talk about. So we look forward to hearing you speak. Thank you. Okay. How are we <laughs> you, since yours is up first, do you wanna, I don't know how we should do it. Mariam's is up first, but I can also go first. So okay. if we're, we have to exit this to get yours. Yeah, we didn't have to, to do this. Yeah. 
Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm really uh, excited to be here with these two wonderful artists and brilliant minds and amazing friends and collaborators for a long time. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce a couple of projects that I've worked on with Chris and Mariam, and then um, I'm going to give it over to them so that we can really hear uh, about, use tonight to really hear about their projects, which are um, I feel rich, complex, and uh, very rewarding. So um, I have known Chris and Mariam for a combined probably like 40 years, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've known Mariam for 16 years <laughs> and Chris for maybe 24, so <laughs> 20, 23, 24. So um, our collaborations have uh, been, have arisen organically from our intellectual synergy, our overlapping areas of interest, and also um, our interest in working collaboratively, non-hierarchically, um, with history and with combining image and text. So uh, some of those are some of the key ways um, in which our work takes shape. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about two projects that um, Chris and I did together. The first mm -hmm. one was um, in 2008. Uh, it was an installation that was comprised of mm -hmm. uh, numerous sculptural and painting pieces um, that was on view in Shanghai. And both of us were interested in the ideas uh, behind a certain mythology of a, a group of saints, the Mahasiddhas, who, uh, who attained enlightenment through um, transgressing boundaries and engaging with abjection, among other things. So it was this combination of transcendence and abjection that we were interested in investigating the intersection of and also um, in having fun in the process. So um, here, is, here is one installation shot, and then there's a detailed image of this piece. Do you wanna say something about this? Um, uh, a very common image with the Mahasiddhas, and this is also an image that comes up in other cultures' understanding of sainthood, is of the flayed body, uh, flesh, the skin that's taken off body. So in Christianity, in, in Catholicism, you have St. Bartholomew, and you've seen images of as he stands, just his muscles holding his, his skin. Um, and oftentimes, you'd have these Mahasiddhas say that they had reached enlightenment uh, while being wrapped by the skin of a, of a dead person, which is this, again, this absolute abjection, but then this absolute um, ra you know, raising of consciousness. And that the intimate relationship between those two processes was very important to us. Um, yeah, and it was, and we had, um, we'll talk more about the nuts and bolts of making our work, but uh, this project involved lots of fun stuff like finding a sewing machine in Shanghai with a bunch of teenagers, um, which Chris can tell you about later. Um, al along, the, along the lines of the idea of thinking about uh, materials that are both abject and beautiful, we worked with hair, um, both human and artificial hair. Um, Chris was talking to me a lot at that time about um, the idea, Michael Taussig's idea of matter out of place. Oh, and uh, uh, no, it's, no, it's not Taussig, it's uh, it? Mary Daly. Okay, it was Mary. Uh, re religious studies person, but yeah. Okay. But Michael yeah. Taussig references it a lot. So. Okay, no, th no, I, I forgot. Thank you, I stand corrected. So yeah. basically, uh, that, that was very interesting to me in regards to looking at hair as a, as a signifier of femininity and beauty when it's on the head and as a symbol of, um, I guess, abjection or excretia when you see it on the floor, on the subway platform, or um, anywhere else 
off the human body. So um, that was that was another piece that we um, worked on while while we were there. And the piece in the back is also one of our first pieces. And there's this idea. This often happens when you see. Um, Things that, that both valorize and demonize people of color is you'll have this beautiful relationship between the abject and and the, the exquisite or the transcendent. So you have like gold grills as a thing are like both like they're gold, so they're transcendent and they're but they're also abject. Like there, there's also a, an abjection to them, which is really interesting. And yes, and that that idea of of both like celebrating the bling while severely typing and restricting the subject that produces that thing. Um, and this is a final piece in, the, in this installation. Um, I wanted to share one, one other installation with me. So something that I think um, connects all of our works is trying to put our finger on the pulse of untold stories and looking for ways to bring um, unarticulated narratives, unapproached subjects to life through our imagination and also our historical research. So um, the trying to visualize something that is invisible or absent is something that's really um, near and dear to my general project. And uh, one of the things that we, this is another project that we did. Um, it was, the project is called Haunted Documents. And do you want to say something about that? Sure. The plasma photos? Um, so in the early days of photography, when there was this, this um, moment in which photography was being taken unquestioned, unquestioned as documents of something real, you know, so they were used in court cases. In those early days, photographers who are all liars, you know, that the, there's this beautiful moment in which photographers say, we're photographing ghosts, we're photographing spirits, we're photographing spirit mediums. And so the, these photographs became well known and fairly popular. And we, we were interested in that. Um, again, there's a, there's a duality in that where there's an absolute belief in the scientific, but there's also a belief in some spiritual world and how, what is the relationship between those two um, and the, the seeing the unseen at the center of it. And I think this is this was really interesting, uh, compelling for me too, because you see this also in early film and silent film that before film and photography developed an indexical relationship to reality and started to function as a transparency through which something was objectively rendered, they were actually quite playful and fantastical in how they the how these media were treated. So. Um, the idea of the fantasy and the myth actually guiding the development of these particular forms was interesting to me. So these are evidence of um, people's exorcism. Um, so people would have spiritual troubles. They would sit in this room with this photographer, go through the seance, and then they would be provided uh, evidence that whatever matter it was that needed to be um, excised from the body was actually and so we decided to look at that as a form that we could then play with from there. Like that, that this thing that was like um, uh, uh, the evidence of charlatanism, in that we, we wanted to think of that in and of itself as a form. So th these are some of the, the takes that we had on this um, uh, seeing the unseen, the, the rendering the, the invisible somehow visible. And um, in, in this process, so this, the, the um, context for this piece, the setting is a subway tunnel. Mm -hmm. um, this one is on C. So we were interested in this idea of a liminal space, a space, a threshold space between inside and outside, between body and spirit, <coughs> between matter and the immaterial. So uh, all of the places in which uh, these images were created were also somehow a threshold space. Uh, rooftops um, or in, in graveyards. Um, and uh, in our process of working on this project, uh, it was it was an intimate one in which we, the subjects of the photographs were also people that we knew well, and um, some of our friends 
So the, the relationship with the subject and the intimacy there was also present. As, as well as there's also a thing about hand work with all of the work that we've done together. We're both hands with people. Um, and so that, that's, that's kind of central to the way we think is that it's that, that these, all of the, because the traditions that we're thinking about um, are embodied. We, a lot of the things that we think about together are embodied in that way. So. And, and we're both interested in the, the, the histories of the materials uh, that we use in our work. Um, their, their previous histories, their current histories, and also thinking about their future histories. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna now move on to talk about Index of the Disappeared, which is a very um, long-term, ongoing collaborative project that I've been working on with Mariam. Um, the project began in 2004, and um, it began also organically. We were both asked to uh, contribute an artwork to a show that had as its theme artists, curators choose artists who then respond to something in the Republican National Convention. Something that was being <laughs> not discussed uh, something at the Republican <laughs> National Convention. And so we both immediately gravitated toward this issue of post 9-11 um, detention and deportation. So um, the piece, the first piece we did had two parts. So this is um, the first part of it. And then Mariam's piece, which was actually a video, mm -hmm. was installed uh, concurrently to this right next door. So um, part of the way in which um, our project functions is also in its public address mm -hmm. and in the way in which we engage public space and also um, passerby viewers. So um, this, for me, this idea of the, the undercurrent, the, the simultaneous undercurrent of another narrative of disappearance um, and for both of us came to mind as we would walk around New York seeing this, which would be images of people who had disappeared due to uh, the World Trade Center collapse and knowing at all the same time that special registration was happening, people we knew were being profiled, activists were getting in trouble, some of the cases uh, which are still going on today. Mm -hmm. um, so. The project has continued for 10 years because the post 9-11 landscape is a web that keeps weaving itself and <laughs> is now weaving itself on domestic territory more obviously than ever. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else say anything? Whatever, I didn't even. <laughs> Uh, sure, I can talk about this project. So uh, in 2008, Creative Time was doing their sort of multi-city project, Democracy in America. And we were invited to do a project for the, the end of this, the end point of this project, which was the uh, Convergence Center at the Park Avenue Armory in New York. And we found this one room at the armory, which was actually the room that was once the headquarters of the the administrative headquarters of the National Guard Regiment that used to be based at the Park Avenue Armory. And the shelves actually still had the labels on it that were used by the administrative, um, like, yeah, by the administrators of this regiment. So they were, you know, sort of perfect for, they gave us this idea to basically do this kind of exploded archive installation where we, did a site-specific and site-responsive installation of documents from the archive and added a whole series of new documents um, related to military codes of conduct and especially to issues around uh, Abu Ghraib and the, and the torture and abuse at Abu Ghraib. And um, yeah, basically it was dressed up as if it were an office that had just been abandoned in the middle of an internal investigation. And uh, I mean, just to, uh, step back a little bit, one of the um, key aims of our project is to create an uh, archive around uh, mm -hmm. these erasures and absences. So mm -hmm. how do we do that? We research um, mm -hmm. 
particular narratives of individuals. We do a lot of work with legal documents. We look at the language. We look at the way in which the body disappears both from the physical world and then disappears mm -hmm. again through the process of redaction um, or surveillance or detention. So, Or the ways in which those erasures and redactions enable disappearances of physical bodies mm -hmm. through their concealment. Mm -hmm. So this is the another detail image of um, the site. So we use uh, we use the architecture of particular sites in um, putting our works together. Uh, that was at the Park Avenue uh, Armory, and this is a piece that was shown at the Buffalo Public Library. This is an installation, mm -hmm. um, and here's the second site. Right, this was a parasitic archive, basically, where we mixed some of our primary source documents um, and a kind of reimagining of the environment of the library with resources that we curated from the library's existing collection. Um, and this image is an image of a prison in Afghanistan mm -hmm. with um, testimony uh, handwritten and inscribed into the barbed wire. That mm -hmm. was a stuff that we researched and found that was detaining um, narratives. Right, first person testimony about black sites in Afghanistan. Um, I'm gonna go a little more quickly, but uh, <laughs> there was a lot of images here. This you can actually see on the web, so please go right. explore it. Yes, this is the Guantanamo effect, which is a web project we did for Creative Time Reports, and it was uh, at a point after we had been um, taking on online material and making it material, making it physical, translating it into the physical <laughs> world for a long time, annotating it, selecting it. Sharing it with you. Yeah. And then we decided um, it might be time to put it back online to think about how we could take this very idiosyncratic arrangement of material that we had been doing for the physical index archive and translate it back into an online um, uh, venue, but in a way that would preserve um, and, and how to yeah, use the form, structure. yeah, and how to use the form and the structure mm -hmm. of our interaction with the web mm -hmm. to reveal the layers of information mm -hmm. that remain hidden under mm -hmm. our very abstracted um, thoughts around these concepts. Mm -hmm. So you basically, you could click on any of these cards uh, mm -hmm. and you would receive more information. Mm -hmm. Um, this is an image of Omar Khadr, who uh, was just granted bail this week, uh, and he was the youngest uh, person to be detained mm -hmm. at the age of 15. Um, at Guantanamo. At Guantanamo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a letter that he wrote to his mother. Mm -hmm. All of this information is in the public record. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is an image from a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> that is shared with uh, young workers of the FBI and CIA showing them how to bury a missing person. Mm -hmm. PowerPoints are a remarkable trove of imagery about what is happening in post 9-11 policy. And very chilling. Really you chilling. You can imagine <laughs> uh, that this is actually part of the mm -hmm. official HR mm -hmm. kind of training for mm -hmm. people is uh, chilling. Mm -hmm. so, um, the, the cards also involve uh, language, so you could mm -hmm. actually click on all of these and get access and archive of articles and documents. Mm -hmm. um, and they also include um, textual fragments that we felt were very poetic and powerful that were taken from our research. Mm -hmm. This one, for example, is from a poem that was written in Guantanamo, these poems that were scratched onto styrofoam cups with prisoners' nails and then smuggled out by their lawyers. Yeah. And um, this, the idea of state-to-state -state agreements is about the fact that many people remain um, like permanently stuck there because no government wants to actually take responsibility for uh, taking care of the human beings. Or that when that agreements are made for uh, transfers, it's not necessarily a release, it's more like a transfer from one state's custody into another with a series of different assurances made by the receiving state about surveillance for the rest of a person's life, for example, um, or continuing to remain in a halfway house, or a number of like diplomatic um, uh, 
assurances that are made that uh, involve basically um, boons being granted by the U.S. in exchange for these prisoners using, being received. Using the human bodies mm -hmm. of a, a poker chip, yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically. So um, I just show you a few more images and then we move on so yeah. that we can hear the discussion. <laughs> The window, outdoor window installation. That we did at NYU. Yeah, yeah, this was part of our residency at NYU. And this mm -hmm. is another uh, website. It's called radicalarchives.net. And you mm -hmm. can look um, look at it. This is part of a conference that we put together. Mm -hmm. OK. <laughs> All right. Me? OK. Okay, so Chitra asked us to talk about our other collaborations um, because, you know, we happen to be people who collaborate quite a lot. Um, I think you kind of get a taste for it. Um, and uh, one of my long-term collaborations, apart from Index of the Disappeared, is with the choreographer and performer Aaron Ellen Kelly, um, who may have gotten here already. Here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, there she is. Here. Okay, yeah, so she's here as well. Um, and uh, we've been working together for um, nine years on a series of projects that we refer to as performed places. Um, and I'm gonna show you. There was a path you had to walk. One. There was a rank for every house, for every room. Everything named, and the names made an order, and the order made a space. And there she was in her place, placed in her room, Chief in importance, the room itself, the frame to the picture, the shutters closed tight against the possibility of carnage. I myself, I myself, I myself, this is my room. What had happened the year before, the year before that, was hardly more than a reflection of a rim of a glass set down on a varnished table, a ring a year last year. Last year was already dimmed into vague reflections of memories, the cottage loaned by a friend, and cooking meals on a camp stove holding out against something that was later to be more completely shattered, as against something to be too early shattered. They were moved rather than moving, hedged in by comment, by precise and precisely aimed poisonous arrows, by words that meant nothing but that stung all across the surface of life. Ambushed, they dodged. It was a blithe arrangement. They might have made a success of their experiment. They both wanted to be free. They both wanted to escape. They both wanted a place where they could browse over their books. They had friends in common. They had common aims. Americans in London, superficially entrenched. They were routed out by the sound of aircraft. She stumbled down the iron stairs of the Hampstead flat and bruised her knee, just in time to see the tip-tilted object in a dim near sky that even then was sliding sideways and even then was about to drop. Leviathan, a whale, swam in city dusk. Above suburban forests, it was a black gas. She might have broken her leg. As he filled a basin from the bathroom, her mind, which did not really think in canalized precise images, realized, or might have realized, that if she had had the child in her arms at that moment, stumbling as she had stumbled, she might have. No, she did not think this. She had lost the child only a short time before, but she never thought of that. A door had shuttered it in, shuttering her in. Something had died that was going to die. Or because something had died, something would die but she did not think that. And he lifted the slightly tainted bowl of water and said, Poor Julia, poor Judy. And it didn't matter that the papers couldn't pay them for translations any longer. And Rafe said he might as well enlist as give up his time to chart statistics. Why not, he said. Might as well, he said. And she did not shout, how could she? Oh God, enlist then, go, 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 go. But still he went. And she was dragged along with him, bumping over the steps and over the ocean, a creaking trunk wrapped up in twine, the protest stopped up in her mouth. It was shut in her as other things were shut in her because the war will be over, and the war will never be over. After he enlisted, she found the room near the castle. But then he had not yet gone, and this was after the child, and they were just where they had been except for a gap in her consciousness, a sort of black hollow, a cave, a pit of blackness, a black nebula not yet concentrated out into clear thought. The surface was as the surface had been, only colder. Shivering, she received the dregs of what had been, not openly resentful. You will always regret it if you do not have this child. And then September, and the news, the shock, and the fall into darkness. You're susceptible to shock, a face swimming in white. You should not have another child until the war is over. If the wound had been nearer the surface, she could have grappled with it. It was annihilation itself that gaped at her. I'm sorry. 
as if that could possibly mean anything. Did I hurt you, Judy? Okay, so let me unpack a little bit for you the process of collaboration on this particular project. So this is called To Live. And first of all, it's an adaptation of a novel by H.D., the, the modernist imagist poet Hilda Doolittle. And um, second of all, it's a site responsive project that was made on Governor's Island during a residency, a swing space residency uh, in the LMCC um, space on Governor's Island um, uh, that Aaron and I had jointly. So it comes out of a series of different impulses. And the first was, you know, just this time spent on the island where both of us started to have a kind of feeling about the island. Um, and the feeling that we had was a very strong feeling about women waiting for wars to end. Um, and it was attached to these houses, these, these military houses, and this long history of the island as a military community going back to the Revolutionary War and stretching all the way into the 1960s. And it's a very kind of complicated, twisty sort of thing that you feel when you're inside these houses where they're decaying, and the decay seems to match this feeling, right? Um, this feeling of like waiting in war and women who are like pacing. You, you can almost see them when you're there. Um, so uh, we both spent a little time in these places. We, we spent time walking around the island. We started thinking about what we could possibly do there. We researched the history of the island. We thought about particular periods in its history. World War II seemed particularly interesting because there had been actual prisoners of war held on the island. There were also conscientious objectors who were imprisoned on the island. There were WACs, like women who had joined the army who were, there was a regiment of them there. There were also women who were wives who were waiting there. And there's this whole kind of thing where like every military community is kind of like an island already. And how much more so if you're physically on an island, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so uh, then we started to think about how to actually um, build a narrative out of this. And then I took a trip to Berkeley and I was in a secondhand bookstore and I stumbled across a copy of this book. And when I had been um, researching the conscientious objectors, I had uh, seen a mention of this book in a footnote where it said, Bid Me to Live, the novel, is the best drawing room war novel ever written. Um, and what that means is it's a novel that's about war with no war in it, um, mm. where it's all about what happens on the fringes of war to people who never directly participate in the war. And it's all about these kind of aftershocks that ripple out from a war, and it's all about the way that war changes us um, and the way that waiting for a war to end changes us and changes our expectations of life. Um, and it's especially about, and this is kind of unfashionable, I think, but it's especially about the way that the people we become during war are strangers. We become strangers not only to each other, but also to ourselves, and what that actually does to our ability to love. Um, <coughs> and you know that's a kind of a very deep thing. So I found this novel. I said, let's adapt this novel. Um, and from there, it becomes uh, a process of improvisation um, where uh, the collaboration with Erin, um, she's completely um, basically in control of casting uh, dancers, um, thinking about how the movement interacts with the spaces, um, which we, we talk together about which spaces to use. Um, and uh, for example, that, that, that enclosed porch um, where there's that really intense scene. Um, that was something that Erin felt really strongly about. She had been improvising there for weeks. Um, and I wasn't sure about it. I was like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about this space. This house doesn't speak to me really. And then we got in there and I was like, oh my God, you're right. This is, we have to use this. This is really, really important. Um, so, you know, there's this give and take in the collaboration also um, where each of us is bringing something different. Um, so in this particular piece, I was sort of suggesting things that had to do specifically where I saw I need this to be there to match something in the text. Mm -hmm. And then Aaron was saying, we need this for the feeling. 
we need this to be there to bring this particular emotion. Um, and then she and I and these other dancers would just start to improvise in response to the space. And all of that collaboration comes into making the final piece. Um, so we've made a lot of different projects in different places. I'll just like very quickly flip through some images um, to show you that and then we'll go over to Chris. <laughs> um, so this is the, um, the piece that's up in St. Louis right now which is called The City in the City. Um, and uh, it's another collaboration with Aaron. Uh, it's based on a book by China Meville, a sci-fi noir. Um, it's narrated by uh, a, a man, Derek Laney, who's very involved in the activist uh, movement, um, Missourians organizing for reform and empowerment. Um, and um, uh, it's also, I worked with a, a couple of students um, at WashU, U. Um, and it's, it's really draws a lot from Erin's knowledge of St. Louis because she grew up there. Um, so my city is a fragmented this is place. Also my, city is a collaborative my city is a My city is a broken My city is a joke. Well. My city is a box. My city is a mixed My city bag. is a collection of various life. My collaboration with all these my different city is in transition. My city is a dysfunctional home. My city is My city is a small monster. but dangerous but environment. My city a cute is okay. And that's there's an excerpt from it online if you're interested in hearing more. And this is a project we made together on the southwest coast of Norway. Um which has a phenomenal choral score by Kasim Nakfi, a composer we've been working with also for nine years. Um, this is a piece we did for Documenta 13, um, and another one we did for the Shars Biennial 9, um, and one we did in New Mexico, where it was just the two of us driving out there on this crazy road trip um, with no idea of what we would do when we got there and then um, just kind of sorting it out, like partly on the trip there, and then just like kind of driving around, finding places, thinking of things to do there, very quickly sewing costumes together, sometimes literally in yes. the car on the way there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, to the previous yeah. note of you have to really like the person yeah. and be able to sew on sites. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's actually really important, sewing skills and Chitrana really spent, liking each other a lot. Yes, yeah. spent a number of years yeah. sewing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very, very important. <laughs> and this is in a gutted McDonald's on 57th Street. Um, and then this is in a forest in Germany. So wide range of places that we've gotten to go together um, and explore together and really have this kind of um, you know, intense like mutual improvisations together, I think is the best way to talk about it. Okay, that's me done. <laughs> yes, there you are. Um, so excuse me that I'm not all PowerPointy, but <laughs> we got some pictures. So the idea, when, when Chitra approached me and she said, let's talk about collaboration, uh, the first thing that sort of struck me was the idea that so much of what we do is about acknowledging the fact that collaboration is part of our everyday lives already. You know, in, in general, the, the, we're in the theory world. We've talked about the death of the author and the death of the singular author mm -hmm. over and over and over again. I think what, what it's all pointing to is that retroactively we need to understand that nobody does it alone. Um, if you're an itinerant painter in the medieval ages that paints hands, sometimes you'll see paintings in the medieval times of w without hands because they're waiting for the itinerant painter to come by who does paint hands very well. Um, that's, a his that's a historical example of the idea that collaboration is, is well misunderstood even as we are re-embracing it today. Uh, and I think that the other thought that I was having when you were saying, hey, talk about collaboration, was that collaboration deals very well with absence. It deals very well with thinking about absence. So when you, when you have the illusion of a singular voice, there is also the illusion of completeness, of, 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 of a complete thought. Being, being. 
But once it becomes a dialogue, mm -hmm. there's the implication of absence, that there are thoughts that are not being shared, that there are thoughts that are being shared only for the purpose of the collaboration. That absence is, I think, of central importance to all three of us. Yeah. Um, because so often that absence is us, literally. Um, that absence is often, let's say, women's work, uh, African-Americans, bodies, um, any number of marginalized people, we are that absence. So um, I'm going to show you three kinds of collaboration that I've done outside of the collaborations that I've had the pleasure of working with Chitra on. Um, and I will also talk a little bit about the absence that's at the core of them. Um, so this is a piece that uh, I did recently at the Prospect Biennial in New Orleans. Um, early in the mornings in Saigon, in Vietnam, where I was spending time, you'll hear funeral marches. And you'll hear them, and they will remind you so much of New Orleans. They'll remind you, who, if you've been in New Orleans, I mean, if you've been in Saigon, and you're black, and you've missed black people for quite some time because you've been there for five months, and all of a sudden you hear jazz. Mm -hmm. You'll run outside the door, and you'll look for the brass band. Is this coming up? There. And you'll say to yourself, who is this? What, what is going on? What is this history here? From that, myself and a Vietnamese film collective named The Propeller Group, we built a funeral procession that left from Saigon and arrived in New Orleans for the Prospect Biennial. These were drawings I did as a sort of a, a way of selling the idea, of talking about what I wanted to do. Um, the, the through line that runs in this very um, circuitous route from African-American jazz musicians reaching France in the World War I through a guy named James Reese Europe. Um, he, he comes with his brass bands, and then the brass band tradition moves from France to all of its colonial holdings. This is then picked up by Vietnamese folks, who then, you know, th 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 this is why you have this parallel development. Um, and the, it happens at funerals, which again, there's, there's an absence there, a very literal absence, that is also mimicked by the absence of uh, a historical context. So when you ask the jazz musicians in Vietnam, um, hey, where do you get this tradition from? They say China. <laughs> they say, um, well, we don't know where it comes from. It's been around forever. Mind you, they're using these French instruments. They're using them in a very specific kind of improvisatory idiom. Um, so these here are, um, I, uh, <laughs> there we go. Um, these are some of the instruments that I built in Vietnam. Um, uh, and they're played by Vietnamese players. Then I, com I uh, commissioned a score to be made by uh, some jazz musicians here and gave the instruments to some musicians in New Orleans. So this, this is um, a sort of pointing out of the absence. We, ins we inscribe a circle around the various absences that are at play, both the absence of history, the, the death at the center of it, um, the absences of, uh, oops, uh, can't you see some of those absences? Yeah. <laughs> and so. I think that the absences of this journey being tracked, mm -hmm. this kind of transcontinental journey and how all of these places connections mm -hmm. remain buried mm -hmm. for us now. Right. So that's, so that's one set of collaborations. So, and it ends up being not only a collaboration between the credited artists, the Propeller Group and myself, but it's also a collaboration between the musicians, the people who helped me make those instruments. And I think that this is something that you often, in terms of absences that we're talking about, you often don't hear about who helped you make this? How did this happen? Um, everything that we make is somehow, it 
passes through hands upon hands upon hands. The largest absence that you see consistently referred to in contemporary art is labor. Mm -hmm. We want to see the work appear on the wall magically, but where is all the labor? And that labor is something that's super important to me as well. So here's an example. Can I do it in such a way that I can yeah. just think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not a Mac person. <laughs> This is a collaboration yeah, for you right it. now. <laughs> okay. Mariam's the best one, actually. Yeah. See, look. Perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You should be. Did it open at all? Do we have no, I think it just opened one. So, so okay. Hold on. Thank you so much, Mariam. No. Oh, I see. You said that. Okay, so this is a collaboration of a sort. Um, I'm working with the diaries of Vaslav Nijinsky, the. Yeah classical yeah. dancer. In uh, 1917, this dancer, who pretty much founded modern dance, um, <laughs> you, um, kept a journal. And he kept a journal as he tripped into schizophrenia. Uh, the journal is heartbreaking and beautiful. And I love both the text and the subjects of the text, which include everything from gender dysphoria to um, guns, war, and these sorts of things. And what I did was I took failure. Failure, failure is a specter in his life all the time, and I think a specter in ours. Yeah. Oh, well. um, <laughs> but what I did was I, di I did in intricate drawings of what kind of shadow puppets I would like to have. I took them to master shadow puppet makers in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. Those guys were excited to work with me because these were, these were new idioms for them, but at the same time, there was clearly a lot of respect for their art, art, art form, what they do. They cut them from leather, cured the leather, made, did some of the really complex engineering of the puppets. This is one of them. This is the guy who hand paints all the leather. Um, and we made, together, we made these shadow puppets. So this is uh, the workshop of the guy who hand paints the leather. The guy who cuts the leather is different. The guy who makes the handles is different. Um, and when we talk about collaboration, and especially when we talk about collaboration as a sort of a, a new thing, we forget that there's these long, long traditions of art being made by many, many people all at once. Um, so this is, you'll see that the skeleton of this um, puppet these are, these are how, how they make the puppets, cut from paper, based on my drawings. Then these are the final puppets. Um, and how they work within, with translucency, with um, space. So this is that, 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 that one puppet that you saw earlier, but naked, now you see it clothed. Um, and, one of, and, I, and I wanted to show this work primarily because when I got to Indonesia, I found that there was a very, very different understanding of what it meant to be a collaborator. Because nobody there s made things um, on their own, and everyone knew this. At the same time, there were often artists, there are many, many contemporary artists that I liked, I love their work, and they'll take credit for what they do. But they often, even the most big time uh, Indonesian contemporary artists, a guy like Agus Sawagi or um, the Ru Ruin Grupa, these guys, even these Harry Dono, they collaborate with younger artists often and help them, you know, increase their profile. And I thought that that idea that there are these non-Western histories of collaboration that we need to acknowledge, um, and that in so many ways that all of the the new collectives that we deal with. Um, the, 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 the fashion for collectives in the contemporary art world is really just catching up with this much longer tradition. The last, um, can, can we do the same thing with one more folder? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, you can pull. Yeah, pull. The last collaboration, uh, we'll, we'll go forward. The last collaboration that um, I wanted to talk about draws on another tradition a very long tradition of um, collaboration that, you know, because the contemporary art world, that's great, 
um, the contemporary art world is, is late. Theater, music, performance, often they have these well thought of traditions of uh, collaboration that deal with absence as well. Um, so this is a collaboration with an artist who's also in the audience, Kaneza Shaw. Um, back to Jason. <laughs> and um, it's a translation into performance of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. So this is a, um, it's a, it's like sort of a formula, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, going forth by day in its original text. With the West, it's known as the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Um, and it's, there's a formula of what happens when you die? What is the, the ritual of death? How do you tra traverse the afterlife? Um, and so I was brought on as a collaborator for the director, Kaneza Shaw, and we worked to f find in that, in that gap of translation, that translation builds gaps. Translation in that, in that gap there's, there's, a, there's a beautiful absence that speaks to death, that speaks to what, what is missing and leaving that space, creates that space for the absent in that act of translation. Um, and so this is a collaboration not only between me and the director, but it's also a musician, uh, Justin Hicks, actors like William Nadelam, who has worked with Peter Brook, um, other, uh, and other performers. Uh, so uh, filmmakers, so we're bringing together all of these forms in order to, again, trace the outlines of something. And I think that when you're talking about the index of the disappeared or you're talking about you know, the ex the, this, these ectoplasm-based photos that we did, we're always tracing the outline of something, and I think that collaboration really, really does that work well. Um, in a way that the illusion of a complete voice that comes from a singular artist can never do. Um, and, and the gaps, the, the almost like asymptotic structure of mm -hmm. translation of almost getting there and never quite reaching mm -hmm. the exact point that that little tiny gap that mm -hmm. always remains is very fertile ground mm -hmm. for all of us. With adaptation as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. So. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. So we should just, we can just open it for questions. Mm -hmm. I had a whole bunch of questions, but I think you guys could also ask um, mm -hmm. some questions. We're very happy to talk about any of the <coughs> projects or any aspect of the processes or any of the conceptual things. Mm -hmm. Or no? Or? Oh, you just got to kick it off. <laughs> I mean, I think we, we touched on this a little bit previously, but um, there's, in our current moment, there's so much uh, interconnection and actually inextricable connection between the disappearance of bodies and uh, the language of the law mm -hmm. and how we think about the language of the law and yep. the power of law and order. I mean, we mm -hmm. can see that in our project and we can see that when we turn on the news and yeah. go for protests every day. So um, we, I think that's one place in mm -hmm. which we're very interested in how, how the body gets kind of um, itemized into language and mm -hmm. also what remains unquantifiable mm -hmm. actually, which I think we're, we are looking at. Mm -hmm. 
And there is an idea also that the body is inscribed and the body doesn't really exist without being inscribed. Um, and that, I think, is something that we're all interested in. Both what is lost in that inscription of the body in, and th that there is something lost in that translation into text um, mm -hmm. and, and what to do with that loss is, is something that we're both, I think we're all fascinated with. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in my work with Aaron, one thing that has been really, <laughs> one thing that has come up a lot in this use of the body with language are these questions around misreading um, and deliberate uh, disjunctions between the text that's presented and the movement that's presented at the same time. So um, I think, you know, we've always tried to insist on the fact that this inscription of the body into language is often, um, it, it's often an inscription that is incorrect or that is um, an inscription into a place that is the wrong place, right? Um, so, you know, one way to do that is to create these deliberate disjunctions in the films between the text and the image or the sound and the image or different ways in which these things can like sort of uh, jet up against each other and sort of rub against each other and produce these sort of um, uh, discomfort, the, sl the slight moments of discomfort. Yeah. And I mean, I think we see this in mm. literature and classical forms and mm -hmm. sacred texts, and we also see people performing this on an everyday mm -hmm. basis in terms of how they choose to, you know, appellation, the way in which we categorize mm. ourselves, or we don't categorize ourselves, how we bristle against being categorized, mm -hmm. how we bristle against our bodies being slotted into mm -hmm. certain kinds of uh, linguistic terms. So. Mm -hmm. What's fascinating to me, though, is the idea that that there is w that there would ever be a correct way to be mm -hmm. to be inscribed, and I think that that's mm -hmm. that, you know you often hear this in in many places about what kind of appellation people choose, mm -hmm. as if somehow any appellation would be a correct translation, mm -hmm. and there is something to be said on one hand of I want to choose my translation, mm -hmm. but on the other hand there should be always a, a kind of understanding that loss is at the center of translation. Mm. Yeah. But I think, you know, because in a conversation, in a collaboration, there's always a conversation. There's always this kind of dialogical element behind the scenes of a collaboration. I think often that surfaces somehow into the work itself. And that's why the element of language comes in and becomes such a strong part of the work, because we're always in this constant conversation with each other, right? And you see that in actually many, many artistic collaborations, yeah. the way in which language inflects it, so how image and text work together. Mm -hmm. What about you guys? very happy to see that some of that work is being centered and resuscitated both mm -hmm. in a more mainstream art arrangement of objects such mm -hmm. as at the New Whitney as well as in thinking about these uh, historical and political issues. I mean, I think, I think that the other unfortunate, um, I guess, move that I've seen kind of happen between in the interplay between collaboration and absence has been, um, at least for myself as a young artist within a feminist art canon where many 
um, movements that couldn't be ascribed to the master work of one individual, mm -hmm. and many, many players who were very important in these uh, larger movements, mm -hmm. especially collectives of people of color, have kind of um, been not disappeared, but have definitely taken a back seat in um, art history. And I mm -hmm. think that that's also something that you know we we mm -hmm. are thinking about actively. That in the visual mm -hmm. art world, um, mm -hmm. it is hard actually in mm -hmm. for institutions to quantify collaboration. I mean. They usually one person gets invited or the other. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to figure out who who is it really. Like that's what the institution wants often is mm -hmm. some kind of address to the individual. So um, I think that's another kind of consequence mm -hmm. of of the collaboration and maybe the death mm -hmm. or the um, the limitation of the afterlife of certain works mm -hmm. that. I would have never ever seen if I hadn't seen the wax show. Mm -hmm. And then you realize how many, which was a show that was um, a, f a feminist revolution show that was a f art in the 60s and 70s curated by Connie Butler and it was at PS1. And you realize how much of the work in that has actually influenced all of us without mm -hmm. even having looked at it firsthand. And so much of it was mm -hmm. uh, collaborative. I, I think that you bring up something really important. The idea that um, collaboration is b between the artists, it's very, very um, open. It lives in this, this queer space of simultaneity, mm -hmm. which is really beautiful. But then once that, that, that simultaneity hits the institution, it then must be cataloged. It mm -hmm. then must be um, put, into, put within the um, strictures of the institution. Um, and you see this very much happening. It's in as as performance art ages out to be to, be, to become uh, collected. You see that it then becomes reduced from this really living, floaty thing into well, how do we collect a performance score? Mm -hmm. You know, this is what we'll buy of this for, of this of a uh, Carolee Schneeman or um, uh, Hannah Wilkie. You know. What do we? What what is left over from Hannah Wilkie? Something we can buy. She did it. This is how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for us in the beginning of the index, I think also we talked very deliberately about the political choice to collaborate in response to something political, um, and I think one of the reasons we've been able to sustain working mm -hmm. on such difficult issues for such a long time is because we work on them in the space of the collaboration. Uh, I think to think about these things for such an extended period of time as individual artists would have been impossible. Mm. Um, and I think it's, it's the space of the collaboration and the strength that you're able to draw from each other and also the, the, the time that you're able to take away from it by passing it back and forth you know, that allows you to continue engaging, you know, with issues that can be really overwhelming in their darkness, you know, and, and yeah. I think, yeah, I think, I mean, for us also, when we started our work, it was a super, I mean, it wasn't a pre-internet, but I think maybe I had just gotten my computer or <laughs> it was definitely not a time where I could go on to the ACLU website and download 10,000 pages of documents. Mm -hmm. One had to, ask somebody for mm -hmm. the pamphlet that the you know immigration services mm -hmm. uh, NGO had put together that your friend was working at or ask a friend who was a lawyer to give you information that was already released. And so mm -hmm. I think for us, our other collaborators and participators are definitely people who work outside of art. And mm -hmm. um, one mm -hmm. of the, one of the uh, other kinds of collaborators we work with are our friends who are um, criminal justice lawyers um, and mm -hmm. attorneys who work on um, racial profiling of Muslim communities in New York, of, um, of trans women being labeled as sex offenders in New Orleans mm -hmm. and on Guantanamo. Defending Guantanamo detainees. Yeah, Guantanamo yeah. detainees, communication management units. And they also mm -hmm. feel that 
being able to have a discourse about their work in this context is a relief for them mm -hmm. because it is it is very um, difficult and heavy to think about the dark parts, mm -hmm. the dark side of Africa. And, yeah. and yeah. there's also this, I think, this illusion today that we have some kind of completeness of information. Hmm. I think because of the internet, there is the illusion that somehow mm -hmm. all we of got it. The, yeah. that it's all there for Everything us. Everything is And it's there. nice to deal with artists and non-artists to kind of, you know, resurrect that kind of information that cannot be cataloged so easily, be it, you know, the legal work of uh, an Alexia Agatha Cleus or Ramzi Kassam, mm -hmm. or the like, the 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 years of experience in the hands of an old man in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. See, there's one in the back. <laughs> I can't play them because but I. They are playable. Yeah, they are playable. <laughs> it, it was interesting. <laughs> The Vietnamese musicians um, had a hard time with them. They're, they're professional musicians that travel around to um, funerals. Um, but the young guys in New Orleans, they really got down with them because <laughs> they're used to, I think, dealing with uh, broken instruments. <laughs> so. Um, I, I, I believe that there is a, a, a lay understanding that with the internet, all information is somehow accessible. Um, and, 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 it's, and, and that lay understanding, I think, um, does then have repercussions that go in other directions, like our fear of surveillance or our thought that, you know, that, that we're being monitored at all times, you know, uh, th this, the, the, the constant Facebook message that you get that says, um, I, I relinquish, I, I, I do not relinquish my copyright on everything. Mm -hmm. yeah, there is some thought that um, we are in the information age and that all information is somehow accessible to us. And as simple as everybody from primary school to grad school thinking that researching is just Googling it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is part of this idea of the knowability of, okay, just gonna Google it and then we'll figure it out. So, yeah. for, yeah. Yeah. so for the, the Go Forth piece, mm -hmm. um, there was all of this research being done here about uh, the book of Going Forth by Day, mm -hmm. but all of that changed and was really enriched by a trip to Egypt to be in the architecture of the tombs, mm -hmm. which was a, a, a realm of knowledge that I know personally I had not um, thought of in the same way but beforehand. I, I realized that there was knowledge in the spatial kind of configuration of tombs that was really useful for making the project. And you talked about that too, the knowledge of the site. Yeah, yeah the knowledge of the site is really important. And then of course there's like this somatic knowledge, the, there's this phenomenological piece, you know, to of course the work that I do with Aaron, a really important part of it is the phenomenological experience of the place, which is why there's always a body in the work to reproduce that for the viewer. And you know, part of what working with uh, a performer so closely for so long has taught me is that there is knowledge in the body that isn't anywhere else, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and you, you can't reproduce that. And it, in some ways it can never be translated. Ha, ha, ha.